so much. So thank you, thank you so much for the, the introduction. Um, so we're gonna be going through a little bit of a journey. Uh, you know, your cloud will never run out of resources, right? Well. Yeah, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that. So a little bit about who your guides are today. I'm Robbie Lockman, one of two Robbies uh, here today. And I'm a chief evangelist at Harness. So I run all over developer advocacy and evangelism programs at Harness. And Robbie, uh, why don't you give a little bit of background uh, about yourself? So Robbie is the head of our cloud optimization group here at Harness. But Robbie, maybe a quick second about yourself. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, Robbie. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining today. Uh, we have an exciting session ahead of us. Uh, so my name is Ravi also, uh, and I'm the head of uh, product for cloud optimization at uh, Harness. Uh, prior to this, I was uh, CEO and co-founder of Lightwing, uh, which was acquired by Harness recently. Um, so Lightwing does intelligent cloud ops automation to optimize public cloud spend. And uh, prior to that, I ran a couple of tech ventures in e-commerce enablement, healthcare, and consulting. So uh, cloud cost management is a problem and space that's been very important to me first as a consumer and now from uh, the other side as well. Uh, you know, because if, if you're a large organization, uh, doing this right means less cloud waste and more cash flow to invest in what matters. And uh, if you're a smaller organization, it could basically be the difference between life and death for the company. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. So let's talk about what journey we're going to go be going on today. So <clears throat> the first thing we're going to kind of define, well, is the cloud infinite? You know, you're, the, the lure of auto scaling and getting uh, capacity when you need it. Well, is it infinite? Well, there's certainly a cost for it. Uh, also, well, welcome to Kubernetes, right? So the, all the rage these days, K8s, it's portable, it's ubiquitous, but is Kubernetes actually cheaper? Are you getting more density by using Kubernetes? And then also common cloud common cloud cost challenges. So we'll walk through a few patterns of how actually these, these costs can actually rack up very quickly. And also we're giving you some paradigms of actually how to start combating that. So we'll give you the cost challenges and also giving you some patterns on how you can start reducing that also getting a better grasp on it. And then lastly, uh, how to embrace FinOps, paying homage to the Linux Foundation. There's actually a foundation called the FinOps Foundation, which is a sub-foundation, I'm uh, trying to use the word foundation too much, of the Linux Foundation, um, which you can join and also learn more how to combat and also re to uh, report on cloud costs, uh, similar to an agile uh, shop. So the infinite cloud, let's, let's, go, let's talk about, well, why even use a cloud and is it really infinite? Uh, so, <clears throat> But for some of us, uh, if you're if you're as old as I am, cracking and stacking, right? You remember doing this. Uh, now, as a software engineer myself, you know I used to have little servers running under my desk, and then there's servers in other part of the office, and then there's a data center somewhere else. Uh, but really, one of the things that virtualization or even cloud resources has ushered in that there's no more rack and stack. So going from this person here, uh, racking and stacking a, a blade uh, to using something like vSphere, vClient or vCAC, pick your VM program of choice, uh, you're able to actually build an internal cloud, right? Like, hey, you know what? We have internal resources, we have a private cloud and we're no longer subject to racking and stacking when we need some resources. Now you might say, you know what? It, there's a VMware tax or VM tax, but again, you're doing things via software. Now, where we you know the world we live in today, or the paradigm we live in today, uh, no more VM or no more VMware tax, right? So if I need a new instance uh, going from like vSphere or VCAC uh, all the way to the right to the AWS EC2 console, uh, you're able to spin up resources when you need them, right? So you're not paying a license cost per se uh, to spin up a new Linux or CentOS or Ubuntu instance. Uh, you, you have the ability just to pay for the underlying hardware uh, that you're using or on the underlying amount of time that you're using the hardware. And, and this is what uh, Ravi and I will get into a little bit that there's some complexities in these billing dimensions. So there's no such thing as a free lunch, but this is the kind of the world in the public cloud that we live in today. But why do you go, ahead, go about using the public cloud, right? So it, there might be this whole discussion on uh, operational expenditure, OPEX versus CAPEX, capital expenditure, but but really, one of the main reasons why you would use the public cloud is this concept uh, I like to call time to value, right? So not only if you take a look at just a pure uh, hardware portion of it, it's those are low margin services for the cloud providers that, you know, they don't make terribly amount of much money on, let's say, an EC2 instance or a GCE instance. But if you take a look at your organization, let's think about something like this. Let's say all this new tech stack on the left here. You know what? We want to use Kubernetes. We want to use Cassandra as a database. We want to use some streaming such as Kafka. And like we want to use some machine learning such as TensorFlow. 
if you were if you had to bring these technologies into your organization or you were charged just using it well and you had no experience in using it let's take a look at that journey really quickly so First thing you might do, you might buy a funny animal O'Reilly or packet book or A-Press book uh, to kind of teach you about these things. Okay, let me learn from other people who've done it. And also, you might be going about getting certain certifications, right? You might become a CKA uh, or you might, you know what, I need to go hit up Stack Overflow <laughs> to learn more about certain things or you're you know, a data stack certified <laughs> administrator. But basically you're going through that journey to learn how to operationalize that, right? So as a software engineer, hello world is easy. The hard part is what happens in a failure. And this is the learning journey you have to go through. But now if you, if you kind of take a look back at the cloud providers, uh, they offer you something like a quick time to value, right? So here I have an actual screenshot of Amazon EKS, which is Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. If I needed a cluster, I, I actually, I use EKS a lot, uh, that you can actually go and just enter a few details and you have a fully running EKS cluster. Or the same thing could be about uh, SageMaker, right, for machine learning, or Amazon hosted Kafka, or uh, Amazon hosted Cassandra, or pick your public cloud provider of choice. Uh, they're, they're giving you quick time to value by leveraging their operational expertise and bundling it and selling to you as a service, but that comes with a cost. Uh, and so eventually, you're going to get a bill. Actually, this is an actual screenshot of my bill a few months ago that I had from uh, AWS. And I was joking with Ravi, like when we were running through the presentation, I, I actually don't know what the NAT gateway is for. Like I was, I, I blatantly asked him like, I, I don't know if I use one. Like I only use EKS. And I, I maybe spun up one EC2 instance. So I, I use one Kubernetes cluster or several Kubernetes clusters. And I use maybe some other Linux machine types to do some sort of jump box type of stuff. Uh, but why did my build look like this? Well, you know, there's just some rationale behind that, right? Sometimes your bill is complex. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I'm going to dig into that uh, really quickly. Uh, but before we dig into that, going back to my example, I, I, let's say for this bill, I was only using Kubernetes, right? Which is true. Like for the most part, I was only using Kubernetes, but let's, let's unpack some stuff. Please save us my TKH for Kubernetes. Uh, so some of the benefits of Kubernetes, if, if uh, some folks in the audience, you know, have dabbled with it or not sure what it is, uh, so just quickly why folks are going towards Kubernetes, uh, your dev team and your operations team can speak the same declarative language, which is this YAML format when you build Kubernetes manifest. And so I'll, I'll role play here. Let's say Ravi was a, a software engineer and I'm, I'm an application infrastructure engineer. Uh, you know, we can simply declare what needs to happen in a failure or how we scale, like very non-functional requirements of the application. Uh, we're speaking the same language. Uh, it's portable, right? So Kubernetes, uh, vanilla Kubernetes running in one cloud, if it's running in your data center, it should run similarly uh, outside the public, in the public cloud, right? And also Kubernetes, if you don't like the opinion, it's pluggable. So you can change the opinion of lots of things. You don't like how the ingress controller is, get a new one. If you don't like how a certain load balancing scheme is or a certain sort of placement scheme, you may replace it. And also vanilla Kubernetes itself is one of the, uh, I would say one of the premier applications of the CNCF, uh, sub-foundation of Lynch Foundation. It is free of license costs. Right? So it's all the benefits. Uh, now, now, but there is an outside uh, to Kubernetes. And, and this is a real number. Um, <clears throat> we, about five weeks ago, uh, we, so we, so our, our platform, uh, when we're running things in AWS and also our second cloud provider, which is UCP, uh, we design things for safety here. So if there needs to be a scaling event, it will occur. Um, but uh, somebody, uh, it wasn't me, Ravi, I, I know who it is actually, but somebody um, uh, ran a sample application, hello world, but th they kind of left like some of the scaling rules or auto scaling stuff uh, out of check because they were doing like a load test and hello world uh, in about five weeks ago cost us $15,000. This is fifth, this is the price of a Honda Civic. <laughs> this is what it costs us, right? Uh, and so it, it can be quite expensive, right? And this is like Kubernetes, right? So the, the auto scaling group kept kicking off over and over, nodes were getting added over and over again as density increased and the work couldn't get placed, uh, but it was quite expensive uh, to, to run that. Uh, someone had a speaking to <laughs> come on Monday morning. Uh, but going back to this, like, hey, you know, why did it cost so much? Well, sure, like, doesn't Kubernetes scale? Oh, absolutely. Um, if you take a look at Kubernetes, what's actually needed for Kubernetes to run, um, each one of these nodes are going left to right. Um, so you have a, if you're unfamiliar with the ar architecture Kubernetes, there is a, a controller to worker node uh, 
uh, relationship. So for example, you might have two masters, you know, one is hot, one is just there for disaster recovery, and then you have N number of worker nodes. Uh, but with this, each one of those little icons there, it's a piece of infrastructure, right? So every time there's a node, there's an East 2 instance, right? So that those, those cheese looking things that are stacked together, uh, that, that's the, the icon for Amazon EC2. But every time you spin something up, you're paying for it, right? And not only that's, you know, going back to this number here, well, I kept spinning up and up, but there's more things to that dimension, right? Not only are you paying for the underlying hardware or the underlying like compute, there's no such thing as a free lunch um, or, or free beer, lunch, beer, depending on your, uh, which way you want to swing it uh, in the free world. Uh, you're, a, you're paying for the control plane, right? So you're paying for the expertise that the cloud provider has instilled upon you to spin that stuff up. You're paying for every piece of underlying storage and compute. Not only is it the compute, but you know, it has to, it has to be a disk somewhere. You know, there's the run the ether. So paying for paying for storage. Uh, also, what, what gets fairly expensive is logging, right? So we can go go on and on how we actually optimize for logs, uh, but uh, logging incurs cost, right? Incurs storage, in, incurs, incurs usage of if you're using um, AWS, you're paying Cloud, CloudWatch cost per, per number of writes or per tens of thousands of number of writes. Uh, you're paying for that networking, right? So if you hit the IO between the Kubernetes nodes, the, my NAT gateway, which I, I, I literally still don't know why, <laughs> I couldn't build for that for 162 hours. Uh, you can see it's a little, a little salty about it. Um, uh, but you're paying and data transfer and then just pile it on, right? You have other services. Okay, you need to do a build, to deploy an application, you're paying for that. You need to have source code stored there, uh, which creates, which, make, which the build makes, which deploys, uh, you're paying for all of that. And this is where the billing complexity starts to get in. Uh, and so, uh, what are some of the challenges of Kubernetes, right? And, and so this is, we're going to start getting into like some of the, uh, optimizations on your on your Kubernetes workloads and your non Kubernetes workloads. So, <clears throat> Kubernetes is still a piece of infrastructure. It still has to be maintained. Um, <clears throat> going back five or six years ago, when I, you know, my team was trying to leverage Kubernetes for the first time, or we're trying it out, there is a sense of this air about, hey, you know what? Just put it on the cluster; it'll auto scale. But as we know there's theoretical limits or there are actually physical limits to that. Like it's not infinite, like the public cloud, right? Uh, your cluster resources will be exhausted. And also operationalizing it is very difficult. Like it, it takes several people to optimize that, right? It takes someone, a platform engineer to say, you know what, the, pro the project up until very recently was moving extremely fast and they've gotten better and more mature about slowing the release cadence out, but uh, trying to make sure that you're on this, some version of it, how do you maintain a platform, patching it constantly, it was a challenge. And also the maturity curve is still building, right? It's still an ongoing uh, technology that people are starting to adopt. It's not like using a, a single Linux instance that's, you know, there's people with 20 or 30 years of skills, battle hardened, it's the project is, you know, from 2015, right? So it, it, it's, it, there's still a lot of maturity uh, getting built on. Um, one question that I, I try, so I recently try to tackle this question, like, hey, how, how much overhead does Kubernetes take up? So in, in this particular example, I, I just, uh, going one step in, uh, the machine size that I use for my Kubernetes workloads typically are like four CPU, 16 gigs of memory. And the typical pod, the typical resource size when I go and request it is, oh, I have these eight gigabyte resource pods, right? But what, and some very interesting things that were happening here uh, was for myself is that, well, I, my box has 16 gigs of memory, so I should be able to put two of those at eight gigs, right? So some of the more experienced people here are rolling their eyes, like, of course not. You know, there's there's overhead. Well, I forgot that, <laughs> so I was only placing one at a time. So simply by simply running uh, freem freem mem, I can SSH into a worker node. Uh, you can see that hey, you know what, Kubernetes is taking up 350 megabytes of overhead. Uh, if you run top, um, you can see that it's taking up about three percent at idle. So just there, there's overhead too, right? It's not like hey, your operating system clearly takes overhead when it starts up. Uh, so does your container orchestration platform. It uh, takes up overhead. Uh, and so with that, Ravi, why don't you, uh, why don't you kind of explain about certain things about Kubernetes, what you can track and what you, uh, what you should be tracking. Thanks, Avi. And uh, just, just to be clear for that, hello world example, it wasn't me either. <laughs> so uh, so um, one of the challenges uh, with Kubernetes is that everything gets amplified, right? So uh, the problem can scale and get out of hand much faster. 
uh, it's like this powerful force multiplier, and then it's critical to make sure that the uh, that the multiplication is positive. So, from a cost and management perspective, it's a good idea to monitor Kubernetes events to closely track things like change in replica count, whether running containers are whitelisted or not, uh, how many pods and nodes are running at any given time, uh, what the utilized and idle resources are within a pod, and at a higher level for the node capacity, what the unallocated resources are that are not claimed by any pods. And of course, finally, uh, any anomalies in cost, and this can be up or down, right? So it's uh, obvious to track cost spikes, but cost, uh, cost crashing could be equally important to monitor as well. So what else can you do, right? Um, another thing that can be really impactful is to orchestrate the pods and nodes, both vertically and horizontally, based on various metrics of usage. So uh, scaling the count of pods in a node and the count, the, and the count of nodes themselves, uh, scaling them up or down as required is an effective way to save uh, wasted resources. Right-sizing the node to make sure it isn't too big or too small uh, balances the cost and performance, and that's another helpful uh, correction to make. Uh, similarly, for pods, making sure that the right request value is set based on historical resource utilization and current usage patterns, that's an important, um, uh, that's an important balance to strike again. Now, uh, running nodes on cloud excess capacity is another great way to save significantly on the compute costs uh, of those machines. Basically, spot instances on AWS on Azure, uh, and they're called preemptive VMs, uh, preemptible VMs on GCP. So think about this, right? So these are spot instances with the very same performance, and they come at 70 to 90% cheaper costs than on-demand machines. Now, the primary challenge, of course, is the lack of availability guarantees, meaning that the cloud provider can take away that instance at any time. But if you have mechanisms in place to handle spot interruption seamlessly enough, the cost savings can be huge. And finally, we have uh, forecasting of spends uh, based on historical usage. Now, this is always uh, important from a cost governance standpoint to make sure that we're not exceeding what's been budgeted already. Right? So I, I know there's a lot of work packed into three little bullet points, but the payoff can be well worth it, uh, well worth the effort here. So, so Oh, go ahead, Roy. Yeah, yeah. so um, I was just saying, so, so let's look at some of the common challenges around uh, cloud cost management overall, uh, even outside of uh, just the Kubernetes world. So maybe not for other things in life, but certainly for your cloud bills, less is less and lesser the better, right? So what are some of the common, common challenges we may come across? Now, um, firstly, vendor lock-in with cloud providers can prove very costly at scale. Now, by design, it's extremely easy to provision and migrate resources into a cloud provider, but complicated and often prohibitively expensive to migrate out, right? So vendor lock-in is when you're essentially forced to continue using a uh, cloud provider because switching away uh, is just not practical. So it's a good idea to consider a multi-cloud strategy to make your apps portable and so on. Um, and then next, uh, you may have over-provisioned over or under-provisioned resources that are either costing you more than they should or not giving you the performance that you need. And then we have uh, idle and orphaned resources, uh, which could be adding to your monthly costs when really they are candidates for terminating. For example, in AWS, this could be uh, EBS volumes that are unattached, uh, snapshots that are old and unused. It could be load balancers or target clusters that nobody's using and so on. Now, uh, in fact, we just witnessed an example recently where there was a non-production AWS account with a ton of resources. So load balancers, EKS, target clusters, et cetera. Um, so these are provisioned, no, no one knew when or why. Uh, and a simple cleanup ended up bringing down the bill for that entire account by 40%, right? Can you believe that? And uh, no, so that might be a high number, but this is surely a simple and worthwhile exercise for any savings number that's greater than zero. Um, and next up we have, uh, given the huge number of options, making the right choices can also be a challenge. So this could be uh, picking between uh, reserved instances, savings plans, or spot instances uh, for, for VMs that you're running. Uh, it could be choosing the right tier from multiple available options for SD buckets, EBS volumes, et cetera. Um, and then you have the somewhat extreme complexity in the cloud provider building that Ravi just touched upon. Um, you know, first you have multiple services from each and every cloud provider, just AWS has over 200, right? Uh, and many of them have their own pricing models. So it's a lot to keep track of. And as we know, complexity leads to inefficiency. So, um, and lastly, we have the challenges around how we accurately forecast spends based on historical usage patterns and current usage and how we can uh, correlate them to our defined budgets. So what are some of these uh, cloud cost management patterns? So given all the complexity and all the spend that we have. Um, also as engineers, we're, nat I was, we're natural optimizers, right? So it's not, not only are you saving money, 
but potentially you're allowed to have more density too, right? So it might not boil down to me like, you know what, I'm saving number of instances, but I'm able to maybe bin pack a little bit more. But Ravi, uh, what do you take it away about some common patterns to fight the ever creeping cost and uh, mal utilization? Absolutely. So uh, we can actually, we can think of uh, cloud cost management under three uh, interconnected pillars, so to speak, right? So first we have cost visibility or cost transparency, then we have cost optimization, and then we have cost governance. Uh, as they say, you can't improve something that you aren't mentioning. So it really starts with overall accurate visibility of what services and resources are being used, who's using them, what are they using them for? Um, are there any resources that aren't attributed at all? Are there any that are idle or unused and so on? Um, also to have cost visibility into the application services and, and environments that are provisioned through the CICD pipelines that are being used. Um, and then on the optimization pillar, we have right sizing, basically making sure resources are only as large as they need to be. Uh, we have committed use discounts, again, RI savings plans, uh, evaluating spot instances for high availability clusters, fault tolerant and stateless workloads. Um, and then elasticity in terms of scaling the count of resources up or down based on various usage metrics. Um, and then on the cost inventory management or asset management side, as they call them, for EC2 or uh, VMs in general across cloud providers, uh, it could be S3 buckets, CBS volumes and snapshots, uh, elastic IP addresses, Redshift clusters, um, making sure that all of these, are, that there aren't any unallocated assets amongst all of these, and then uh, business mapping of these resources across organizational hierarchy, which could be for the entire company, it could be for business units, teams, applications, and even team members. Um, right? And finally, uh, the last pillar that we have is cost governance, um, essentially setting periodic budgets, which could be monthly, quarterly, and yearly, uh, and having accurate forecasts uh, of spend against the set budgets. Yeah, so we did talk about cloud excess capacity spot instances a little bit earlier on, uh, but it may, be useful, uh, uh, it may be useful context to spend a minute on where exactly this cloud excess capacity is coming from, right? Uh, so the fundamental promise of public clouds are when we need more resources to service our usage, we will be provided said resources, right? Now, in order to fulfill that promise, cloud providers need to maintain excess capacity. And until this excess capacity is requested, it's idle and unmonetized. Right. So to monetize this otherwise idle excess capacity, cloud providers give us the ability to spin up these spot instances at up to 90% cheaper rate, with the caveat, of course, that they reserve the right to take away that machine from you with a short notice, and that's usually under two minutes. Right? Um, so because you're getting the same performance with these spot instances at deep discounts, if they are a fit for your workload, meaning that if you have a high availability cluster, if they're fault tolerant, if they're stateless and so on, and if you have a strategy in place to gracefully handle interruptions, um, then the cost saving benefits really are incredible. So uh, here's a probably tweet from a few years ago, which reads, AWS isn't about paying for what you use, but paying for wh what you forgot to turn off, right? And it's true for any public cloud really. So, uh, and this is one of the biggest challenges for non-production resources. And there's no surprises why it resonated with so many people out there. Um, so let's look at this in, in some more detail. So we know that this is a problem, but how big is the problem? Now, we're talking about non-production resources here, right? which could be QA, staging, development, demo, R&D machines, essentially everything that doesn't service live traffic. So unlike production environments, um, you know, these are used by developer teams for maybe four, five, six hours in a given workday. So you have many idle windows even during work hours. And of course, non-working hours, weekends, company holidays, these environments are completely unutilized. So if you compare the four to six hours of actual usage, usage versus the full 720 hours in a calendar month, that's 70 to 75% of the month that are actually idle, but you're still being charged by the cloud provider. So how about using a static resource scheduler that forcefully shuts down these environments, maybe, you know, maybe after working hours, and then brings them up, uh, back up again at a fixed time every morning. Well, uh, firstly, there's no way to statically predict idle times that occur within working hours. You know, when your developer teams are maybe in meetings, they're on lunch breaks or working on other things. And then let's say the scheduler forcefully shuts down everything at 8 p.m. Now, there's no way to access these stock machines uh, even if you needed to, right? Um, but using native cloud provider offerings such as load balancers and cloud CloudWatch metrics to detect real-time traffic and usage and performing shutdown or terminate actions automatically when resources are idle, that's a great way to avoid potentially massive wasted spend here. So just imagine for uh, all of the resources in use by all of us in this room today, uh, while we're here together at this, in this webinar, uh, if there was a way for all of our environments to get shut down and only be brought back up again when we needed them next, I mean, that's almost like magic. Right? And um, you know, if you find a way also to run these resources on spot instances, now you're, now you're a pro.
that's that's so funny just like a personal corp like probably half of my career has been like in elastic infrastructure and half of my career has been not elastic infrastructure and what Ravi said there turning turning on is hard so I I used to share a script I used to work for an investment bank and so like we would constantly bicker over like we used to put a web sphere and like constantly bicker over like hey do you need that node do you need that underlying vm that's powering your application so i used to write scripts that go and touch folders in each one of my non-production environments throughout the day so the monitoring that the bank had would say oh yeah someone's accessing it because it wasn't turning it off as hard it was re-spinning it back up and, and i you know even with all the cloud native stuff or last give structure even leveraging like or an orchestrator like Mesos or like Kubernetes itself, um, I still haven't shaken that, right? Like I still like, oh, if it goes away, it's not going to be there. But that, probably this is so true. Like tur turning it back on is like super hard, man. <laughs> uh, so so with that, oh, actually, it's my turn to talk now. So um, with all of the wisdom uh, that uh, Ravi has disposed upon us, uh, it's that there's also this concept called FinOps, right? And so what is FinOps? It, it sounds a lot like DevOps or one of those monikers like something ops, DevSecOps, FinOps. Um, but what is actually is FinOps, right? So there, there is uh, a, a movement behind a particular how to optimize cloud usage, how to optimize cloud spend. Uh, but similar to any sort of, let's say, paradigm shift, it, it, it's, it's more than just a set of practices, right? It's a culture. Right, it's a governance structure. It's a team. Um, it's similar to DevOps. If uh, you ask any DevOps pundit, um, it, can can you hire one DevOps engineer and you have DevOps? No, DevOps is a culture. Right, like you don't just get to check the box that you have DevOps. You don't check the box uh, that you have FinOps. It, it really takes multiple stakeholders. Right, and and kind of like my definition, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Like you know, FinOps is uh, really the DevOps of finance. Right, w which is interesting. Um, it's it's helping multiple stakeholders from the financial teams to the operations teams to the engineering teams, development teams. It, this particular pinwheel or life cycle really looks a lot like agile, right? Uh, you're able to, uh, quoting Ravi again, you can't, you can't optimize what you can't measure, right? So you're get, making sure that you're getting the right metrics to, to, to inform. And like, like I said before, like as engineers, uh, we're not natural optimizers, right? We wouldn't be doing what we do if we didn't like to optimize things. And so making decisions, informed decisions on the data or metrics or usages that we have, uh, and then really getting that back into, okay, we can fine tune it. You know what, like what I learned, like, hey, there's you know, workloads are not being placed in these particular nodes because uh, there's overhead. I need to, you know, I want to have density of two pods. Uh, per per worker node, I need to change something. I need to scale back the, the resource limits of the pod, or I need to figure it out to get a bigger box, <laughs> right? And so there's just that push and pull. And then making sure that we're able to implement that and then also making sure uh, the the adjustments that we made are, are prudent, right? And so if you want to learn more about FinOps, uh, you can head to finops.org. Uh, as Harness, we're a member firm of the FinOps organization, also a member firm of the Linux Foundation. Uh, this is a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation. Uh, there's lots of resources, no matter where you are, from a system engineer uh, to a financial analyst and anybody in between or above and below. Uh, there's, there's lots to learn uh, at the FinOps Foundation, like funny personal corp. You know, if taking my career back years and years and years ago, I used to butt head with the system engineers. You know, there's probably a lot on this call, but as an application engineer and application developer, uh, my greatest nemesis uh, was, you know, I used to drop IP tables all the time. I'm sure some people will be rolling around like, don't do that. But I didn't know how my application communicated. Sad story. But as years went on, you know, DevOps run us closer together. We're, you know, kind of like have the same goals. Uh, currently, uh, or up until recently, my, Ravi, do you want to guess who my nemesis <laughs> is at the manager now? <laughs> it's fine. It's finance, right? Like yeah. my ne the nemesis is switched from the operations team as a leader now in the firm. Uh, it's I have these bills I need to pay and I have a budget I have to set, you know, for the rest of my team to like, hey, I have forecast or any of this bill is going to be X number of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, my nemesis is the uh, finance, right? But aren't the same, but with FinOps, the same silos that have been brought down with DevOps is coming down uh, with, with uh, in, in finance and organization. Uh, so with that, 
you know, I think this is the end of like the our, our you know speaking to folks part of the presentation. I'd love to get questions. Um, if you want to copy the slides or just learn more about how we interact with FinOps or you know the stuff that we're doing at Harness, give it a scan. Give this Bitly here a scan. I'll take you to a site. You can grab a copy of the slides if you want, or sign up for uh, certain things that we have at Harness. But I will uh, stop sharing there, and we can take a. Or actually, I'll keep this up if anybody wants to take a look. Uh, and we can answer any sort of questions that came across. So, yeah, and for and for the audience, um, feel free to ask any questions you want uh, in the Q and A section. Love love to hear from you. Love to just chat. So, Ravi and I are here uh, to help answer any sort of questions. It doesn't have to be technology related too. It could be about the meaning of life. I think it's 42 is what the computer came back with. <laughs> right. Ah, okay. So here's the question. Uh, how to take, uh, how, so I guess I guess like how to start your career in Kubernetes or how to take your career to his Kubernetes. Um, I, I can answer that one, Ravi, if you wouldn't mind. So yeah. uh, No, I'm silly. Go for it. There's lots of ways, like any any sort of like any sort of technology. There's there's a lot of resources. You're at the right spot, uh, the Linux Foundation, right? So, um, as as a custodian of many of these projects, uh, there's lots of ways. If if you've never used Kubernetes before, this is kind of like off topic for the webinar now because I had to go through journey. Um, maybe you, maybe if you have uh, access to a, a Windows machine or a Linux instance, uh, there's a, there's a project called Mini Cube. So it installs a Windows with uh, PowerShell access now. So, but anyhow, uh, I would take a look at something called Minikube and then just running through some very quick uh, manifest applications. So Kubernetes works in this console, like at the very simple level, it's a declarative system. But what that means is that you author a manifest, it's in YAML, you say, hey, you know what? I want this image to be accessible at this port and I want it to have this many copies of itself. Uh, you can make a very simple deployment, like, you know, eight or nine lines of YAML. Um, and just deploy it and watch the magic in the terminal as it deploys. So that as you get more comfortable in that, as you'll start to figure out everything in Kubernetes is is, uh, is pluggable, right? So it's you, you can change the opinion. It took me a while to figure that out. Like, hey, I don't like how it does this. Swap out things. You can modify the controller, how it operates. You can modify the, the you can make custom resource definitions. You can change opinions. You can influence it. Um, there's these influencing words um, that you can uh, kind of like, Lack of a better word, like influence or stuff gets placed. So, uh, yeah, that's that. That's definitely it. Um, good question. Okay, so another question: uh, How to merge the finance team and operations team? Because you're definitely uh, different business units. Ravi, you have a little bit more experience because you've seen. Yeah, you, you have bigger bills than I do sometimes, so you have to talk to the higher ups. But why don't you uh, talk to that question? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, typically, ju just like with most um, um, sort of relatively newer functions, so this is this is a sort of function on its own. Uh, while there are aspects to both things, so there are finance aspect, there's there's operation aspect, but fundamentally, this is um, yeah, th this is a, a separate um, uh, a sort of uh, role and capability that uh, that organizations have now started having uh, for all of the reasons that uh, that Ravi mentioned. So it's it's typically um, yeah, like uh, like like a skill in a department on its own. Cool. Um, okay, so a couple more questions about starting out with uh, Kubernetes. Uh, as another person mentioned, like there, there's several other packages. Yeah, I like to call there's like K3s and kinds. So thanks, Chris, um, about that. So there's there's just multiple like uh, local uh, local ways to start cluster. Because also you can like if you want, you can use one of the public cloud vendors too. Like if there's there's credits usually for like first time users. If you want to spin up an EKS instance or GK instance or AKS and that's your um, so the, there's, there's, there's two sets. There's the, the folks, this is going back to that question. There's two sets that, uh, there's the folks authoring the workload, which you know, let's say you're writing a Java application. Well, it needs to be Dockerized or it used to be, uh, you need to have a Dockerized to run Kubernetes. And so usually an application engineer will create at least the code that either a build engineer or application engineer themselves can make a Docker. 
for your image. And then when it runs in Kubernetes, it's a container. Um, so, but you can get a lot of pre-baked ones, right? Like Nginx is the quintessential, you know, deploy library slash Nginx. I think, you know, they hit the, hit the rate limit in Docker Hub because <laughs> so many people use that as a, as a first one. Uh, so yeah, you, you don't have to necessarily be an application engineer. You're just authoring that, those eight or nine lines of uh, YAML manifest. Uh, so for uh, the other question, uh, are there any other ways to lower costs other than a spot instance? I give it to Ravi again, the cloud guru here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so spot is a, is a really good way, but it is uh, something that's specific. Um, now, uh, fundamentally, in terms of lowering cost, there are a couple of ways to do that. Right? So uh, one is in terms of making sure that the elasticity is right. Uh, in terms of are you running uh, the number of, uh, it could be instances, pods, nodes, et cetera, uh, that you actually require and no more. Um, the other is to also look at um, scaling vertically, right? So um, uh, do you have, uh, if it's uh, Kubernetes, are the, the request um, and limits set uh, to exactly what you need? Um, there, there's no um, idle or unutilized capacity there. Uh, if it's a if it's a VM or if it's an EC2 instance in the AWS example, um, you know, uh, are those instances the right size in the sense that um, are they too large so that you're actually um, you know spending more than you should be? Are they too small where you're not getting enough performance and so on? Um, so there are a bunch of different ways, uh, but I mean, uh, on top of all of those, definitely uh, spot instances uh, where the workloads are a fit uh, is something that's useful to look at as well. Awesome. I, I really want to take this one. I'll, I'll steal it. Uh, so one question here is, uh, what is a typical overhead time uh, for dynamic scale up and down your nodes? And what's, and is it acceptable for customers running real-time workloads? Oh, it depends. The, everyone's favorite word in the IT world, it, it, it depends. Because like, hey, th there's there's two sets. So like as, as a distributed system engineer myself, like there, there, there are two things that are scaling up. It's a scaling up of the infrastructure being ready to even process a workload. And then there's the time it takes for the workload to start, right? So uh, there's this concept of cold starts, which I'm gonna get into. So um, let's say you spun up a new, I don't know, take Kubernetes out of the picture. You spun up a new EC2 node in your ensemble of uh, workloads. You know, you might be able to get a Linux instance up and running in EC2 in two minutes, right? From the time you said, hey, I need something to the time that the health check passed that it's able to receive traffic. Uh, but then, you know, it's a, you have a blank Linux instance, so you might have an application. Well, it might be a Java application. Well, you need to get the infrastructure on there. You might, there's ways to get around that. You might have it as an AMI, you might have an image that it boots to, but um, Java itself has cold start times. Uh, the languages supporting it have cold start times. If you have a database, another node, there are cold start times to be able to process the transaction, right? And so it really depends on the workload itself. Now, Kubernetes did make that a little bit faster, right? So like, hey, I can spin up a node pretty quickly. You know, the daemon spins something up really quickly, but still it's also on how quickly it can start when the final health check passes, right? So like, you know, you might be able to spin up a new, you know, place a new node in seconds, but the final health check that it's available for traffic or it's be able to send or receive, it could be 60 seconds, 80 seconds, 90 seconds, a minute, two minutes, right? Just depending on what the workload is. And it being, going back to the last part of your question, is it acceptable for the customers? Well, as Robbie mentioned, like you have to architect around that. So you, you do need some excess capacity or buffer. Um, it's good distributed systems principles that it's this something called the fallacies of distributed principle or ugh, the fallacies of distributed computing, you know, latency, overhead, administration costs are not erased uh, by any sort of system. It just is attributed. So thanks for that question. Uh, this might be a good one, a good one for you, Ruby. <laughs> yes. uh, typically, what percentage of nodes are spot instances versus on-demand sort of instances? So like, you know, you might have the same answer. Yeah. It depends, but yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, we could have a slightly more specific one here. So uh, typically when, uh, I mean, if you are using like um, the, the native capabilities of a cloud provider, like let's take AWS, for example, with the mixed instance policy. Now, typically what's actually suggested is that you only have up to 30% of uh, your workloads be spot instances only to service, uh, you know, spikes, uh, increased usage and so on. But um, having said that, if you have spot interruption handling in place, if you use a spot orchestrator, either you've built something in-house or using, or you're using a service like Harness for orchestrating that uh, spot instances, you can actually go ahead and run 100% of your spot instances, 100% uh, uh, of uh, your nodes on, on spot. So, because what happens there is 
um, you know, when there is a spot interruption, uh, then there's an alternate spot that's provisioned for you in its place. There's a fall demand, a fallback to on demand that happens automatically when spot capacity is not there in the market at all. Uh, and then the spot market is continuously pulled. And when the, the spot capacity is back up available again, uh, it also does a reverse fallback back from on demand to spot. So because of all of that orchestration, you can actually run 100% in spot uh, for, for this particular case. Cool. Hey, I like it. That's aggressive. 100% Ronnie. Ooh. I'm excited. Uh, I'll take this one. So it's follow up for the previous question I answered. So uh, are there strategies to avoiding cold starts? Well, so there, there's lots of strategies, right? Like, so given today, if you have a stable workload, you're, you're provisioning, there's lots of discussion of like, how much does a net new user add to the amount of infrastructure that you need to have, right? Number of concurrent users that you support um, when doing capacity planning. So it, it's, what is giving you the capacity? Is it adding another node to the application? Is it adding another node? Uh, you know, are you limiting the number of people who come in? Are you reprioritizing people? There's like dozens of ways you can take this. Uh, but like a cold start, there's certain cold starts you can avoid. For example, um, if the, the, I think the cold start that the, the question is being asked for is like, you have like an in-memory cache and you know the, the next node has to come online. And so now it needs to replicate all the, the key value pairs uh, that, that, you know, it, it did not have, or if it was a failure when it comes back, uh, you know, there's you, you there's certain ways around it. Like in very very high level form systems, you can ship you know a, a block of them uh, at one time. But there's other things that you just can't avoid, like Java cold starts. Like so, one of the I, I get a little bit soapboxy. Like serverless is you know kind of the rage now. So functions as a service, serverless. Uh, there's still a very poor cold start times on, on certain languages, like using Node versus Java, like Node will hand out cross Java <laughs> in terms of what it takes for Java to start, right? Especially if you're having requests that are being sub-seconds, uh, you might want to look at a different, <laughs> you know, different language stack. So it, it really di diagnosed the patient. Um, if you're looking at more like, I'm guessing like an in-memory solution, um, there, there certainly each provider has ways to kind of get around that, but you know, it's, it, it's still something to, to take into consideration. I think that was it for the questions. Um, we still have a few minutes. If anybody wants to ask anything last minute, uh, you know, on behalf of Ravi and I, you can, if you want to chat with us on Twitter, uh, there's two Ravis on there you can add. We would love to talk to you if you want. But if that's it, um, Yeah, I don't see any other questions. So um, thank you again to Ravi and Ravi for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this reporting will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.